Hi friends, welcome back to Duke Majin Wilderness Park in the city of Glendale, California. My name's Jeff Weinstein, and today we're gonna to take a hike through the park looking for snakes and lizards. We've got a special guest with us, Chris DeGroove, and Chris is with the Southwestern Herpetologist Society. And I actually have a list of questions that I'm gonna ask Chris as we hike and as he tries to catch these animals and share them with us. These are the questions that we seem to get when we have our program. So, Chris, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna hit you with a few questions and look forward to learning as we go. Sounds great, Jeff. Okay, well, let's get ready. Make sure your shoes are tight, get your backpack and your water because it's a pretty warm day today and we're gonna hit the trail. Hi, my name is Chris DeGroof. I'm with the Southwestern Herpetologist Society, SWHS for short. Uh, our primary objectives of the society are to enhance the education of our members as well as the general public uh, in the roles of reptiles and amphibians in the natural world. Secondarily, uh, we'd like to promote the conservation of reptiles and amphibians as well as all wildlife in general. And third, we like to promote the close cooperation of amateur herpetologists working with professional herpetologists. I got interested in reptiles and amphibians probably about 15 years ago, uh, thanks to my wife, when she wanted to join the Southwestern Herp Society. And, uh, and from there, you know, we, we got interested in finding the reptiles and amphibians in the wild. And I'd say probably the last 10 years is when I've, I've devoted most of my time uh, helping out various researchers and agencies uh, catalog uh, where the different species are living and, uh, and they, they'll ask me to help out in certain uh, wildlife surveys as well as other projects from time to time. So sitting on this rock right there is a pretty fence lizard. Let's see if I can, if it'll let me get close enough to noose it. It'll consider the string is just like a branch blowing in the wind. And this doesn't hurt the lizard at all. It just goes over their scales and under their scales. And success. So what we just noosed here is a male fence lizard. You can tell it's male because of the pretty coloration on the back, that's to attract the females. And also underneath the bright blue on the sides and the throat. Uh, that's why they're also called blue bellies, if you ever heard that term. Um, you can always tell a fence lizard because of the yellow underneath the thighs as well. But uh, some of the lizards you find in the park are side blotched alligator lizards and skinks and whiptails. And the fence lizard is one of the more common ones. Now, what makes this animal unique is, you know, about 20 years ago, you know, the studies by UC Berkeley, um, they found a protein in the fence lizard's blood that kills the Lyme bacteria for, from Lyme disease. And that's why in the U.S., the incidence rate of the Lyme bacteria in ticks is only about one to two percent, whereas on the East Coast, it's about 60 percent. So what happens, ticks, when they're in their nymphal stage, you know, 90 percent of them will feast on a fence lizard's blood. And as soon as they feast on that blood, the protein in the lizard's blood will kill the Lyme bacteria and that tick will never be able to carry that Lyme bacteria for the rest of its life. So these things are super beneficial out here and, and why on the West Coast, there's hardly any incidences of Lyme disease. And sometimes you'll see these guys doing push-ups too. And that's another way to identify the male. They're trying to attract the female as well as ward off other males. It's, it's kind of like a, a territorial display. And if another male gets too close, they, they may get into a fight. Western fence lizard and I will let it go. Chris, we're out here today. It's about 1.30 in the afternoon. It's 80 degrees, bright blue skies. Is this a good time to be out looking for lizards or should we be out early in the morning or at sunset? People have asked, what, what does it mean to be cold-blooded? We hear that about reptiles. All right, so all reptiles are cold-blooded. They're ectotherms, which means they do not have the capability of generating their own heat. So they need an external heat source like the sun. So usually as it warms up in the morning, the lizards will begin to come out to take in some of that warmth from the sun. And they're a little bit slower in the morning too, just like the snakes are a little snower, slower in the morning because they haven't warmed up yet. And then as the sun begins to set, you'll usually see them again laying on the concrete to take in that last bit of warmth of the day before they retire for the evening. Today, in these temperatures, it's perfect to be out looking for lizards and snakes. Okay, so we're counting on you to find some things. Ah, let's ho hope so. <laughs> so Chris, it's the beginning of April. We're standing here in the middle of Dunsmore Creek. It's been a real dry year and uh, don't see really any water around. 
But if we did have water flowing through the creek, what are the uh, animals that we would see? Okay, yeah, we just checked about 50 yards of this dry creek and we'd have to be pretty lucky to happen to find a snake in those 50 yards when we looked. But uh, as far as snakes go, we have seen rattlesnakes, Southern Pacific rattlesnakes, striped racers, gopher snakes, night snakes, ringneck snakes, uh, patch nose snakes. There's several other species you can find here. As far as lizards, uh, we, we just saw more side blotch and fence lizards. There's whiptails and alligator lizards as well as western skinks here. And as far as amphibians, we're not going to find any today because it's so dry, but you can find western toads and both species of tree frogs here, which are the California tree frog and the Baja California tree frog. And sometimes you'll even find black-bellied slender salamanders here as well. And maybe as we continue on, we, we may get lucky and find some other reptiles as we walk. So now we're at the rock pile here in Duke Majin and it's dry, it's rocky, and this is where we normally see rattlesnakes. Is, is this the prime habitat for them, Chris? Yes, this, you know, rattlesnakes love rock piles. And so this is one of the places I find them the most frequently. So whenever like you're stepping over a log or you know playing around rocks like this, always make sure you look where you're stepping, watch where you're putting your hands because you know getting bit by a rattlesnake is uh, is a very painful and expensive experience um, if you were to be bit by one the most important thing to do is to uh, first remain calm which is easier said than done uh, but you know secure the area and by that i mean don't sit down right next to the snake that bit you uh, you want to remove any uh, restrictive clothing or rings for example because if you were bitten by a venomous snake it's going to swell then if you happen to have a pen or a sharpie on you circle the bite and write the time because the medical professionals are going to track the rate of swelling and uh, that may help them determine how much anti-venom that you're going to need uh, some things you shouldn't do if you're bitten by a rattlesnake uh, do not cut and try to suck it out that's uh, you know, like those venom extraction kits you have at home that, you know, th those are all cons, you throw those away. At, at best, it does nothing. At worst, it may cost you the time uh, you know, to save your life or, or your limbs. As they say, time is tissue. And also, uh, don't, don't apply um, a tourniquet, that doesn't help either. Um, if you're bitten by a non-venomous snake, just soap and water. Uh, that's, that's all that's needed. It's, it's, it's you know, less than a, than a catch scratch. Anything with a mouth can bite you, and especially if you try to pick it up. You're this big, scary creature, so it's gonna to try to defend itself. Snakes especially, all they have is a mouth. Snakes, their first line of defense is to flee. They do not chase you, they just wanna get away from you. If you happen to be standing between the snake and, and its home, which is could be a hole in the ground, it may appear that it's chasing you, it's just trying to get back to its hole. Even prior to rattlesnakes, snakes develop tail shaking, and that's more of a defensive behavior. Uh, rattlesnakes, you know, also shake their tails. They just happen to have a rattle. Uh, and so, you know, obviously you can hear the, the rattlesnake if it's old enough. Baby rattlesnakes are born with one segment and, you know, even one or two segments, uh, you may not even hear it rattle because it's so small. Baby rattlesnakes have slightly more toxicity in their venom, but however, adult rattlesnakes deliver far more venom than a baby can. So it's way worse to be bitten by a, an adult rattlesnake than a baby rattlesnake. Snakes from birth are able to control their venom. They're even able to control which fang or fangs they deliver it from. So Chris was true to his word and was able to catch a gopher snake for us. So uh, how long do you think that snake is? Uh, she's probably about two or three feet. Actually, uh, adult gopher snakes can reach about five feet. And, um, you know, as you can see, it's not too heavily bodied, which is one of the ways you can tell the difference between a gopher snake and a rattlesnake. Uh, rattlesnakes are heavy bodied. They have a big, you know, triangular shaped head. However, don't always use the head as a way to differentiate because a lot of non-venomous snakes like gopher snakes and garter snakes can flatten their heads, making them appear large and diamond shaped. Uh, the easiest way to differentiate a rattlesnake is by the rattle. <laughs> if it has a rattle, Boom, it's a rattlesnake. Um, but if you can't see its tail, then I would kind of use the head shape and the patterning on it. Gopher snakes kind of have like this neat little train track type pattern. And uh, 
rattlesnakes have more almost like a diamond shaped pattern down down the back you know under low light conditions rattlesnakes will have round pupils i have plenty of pictures of that as well and uh, so that's you know there's even venomous snakes in the u.s like coral snakes that have round pupils all the time you know, no slit so so pupil uh, if you're even close enough to look at it is not a good way to differentiate so the number one benefit of snakes is rodent control uh, it's all natural you don't have to pay for it and uh, that's that's what they do if you see a snake in your yard the, all they're doing is following the food and so rodent control and as you know rodents can destroy wiring in your car in your house um, also a study by the university of maryland shows that uh, one snake removes about 4,000 ticks each year from the from the uh, from the wild because those ticks are on the animals that they eat. So that that's another good benefit. And then even when it comes to venom, uh, you know, venomous snakes, venom is used obviously in anti-venom, but also in different medications that people use: uh, arthritis medications, blood thinners and thickeners. Um, it's used in breast cancer research and even an anti-aging wrinkle cream. So there's a lot of benefits of snakes and uh, they all serve a purpose in our, in our ecosystem. So uh, the best thing to do is just admire from a distance and let them do their thing. So Chris, I wanna thank you again for coming out here today and sharing your passion for herps and uh, spreading the information that I think our people need to hear. I think we hit every question that was on our list. So again, thank you. Again, that's Chris DeGroof with the Southwestern Herpetologist Society. Okay, folks, um, hope to see you again. Until then, we want you to take care of yourselves and take a hike.